welcome to the Tune In to Safe Healthcare webinar series. Today's presentation is Lessons from an Outbreak Investigation, Improving Medication Preparation, Use, and Infection Control in Outpatient Oncology. This webinar is hosted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. CDC's mission is to save lives and protect the health and safety of Americans. This mission extends to healthcare quality. My name is Dr. Joe Purs. I serve as the team lead for quality standards and safety within CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. The featured speakers on today's webinar include Dr. Amber Vasquez, an Epidemic Intelligence Service or EIS officer at CDC, Dr. Joel Acklesberg, a medical epidemiologist with New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and finally, Dr. Lisa Richardson, Director of CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. First of all, we do welcome your input, your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via your chat window. That's located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen. You can do that anytime during the presentation. Questions will be addressed after all the presentations conclude, as time allows. To ask for help, please press the raise hand button located on the top left-hand side of the screen. To hear the audio, please ensure your speakers are turned on with the volume up. The audio for today's conference should be coming through your computer speakers. In addition, a reminder that the slides from today's presentation will be provided to participants in a follow-up email. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Vasquez. Afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So um, the investigation began on May 24, 2016, when an infectious diseases physician at Hospital A notified the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene of two cases of exophyella dermatitis bloodstream infections that occurred on May 14th and 15th of that month. This prompted review of microbiology records at Hospital A's network laboratory to search for more cases, and two more were found from April 8th and 22nd. All four of these case patients had an underlying cancer and were receiving care from the same physician at an outpatient oncology clinic, which we'll call Clinic A. And because all these patients were linked to the clinic, the provider at Clinic A started calling other clinic patients back to have blood cultures drawn, even though they weren't sick. And on May 27th, a fifth case was found from one of these surveillance blood cultures. That day, an FDA investigation was requested, and the CDC team arrived to assist on May 31st. So we'll just start with a little bit of background. Exophyella dermatitidis, formerly known as Wangiella dermatitidis, is a common environmental fungus found as a black yeast or mold, and it has been seen in prior healthcare-associated outbreaks, including an outbreak of severe neurologic infections associated with steroid injections from a compounding pharmacy in 2002. Infections with this fungus are quite rare and generally affects the nervous or respiratory systems, so bloodstream infections are extremely rare. But oncology patients are at higher risk for them since they're immunosuppressed from chemotherapy as well as their underlying cancers. And they can also be at higher risk for bloodstream infections due to the presence of long-term central venous catheters, such as implanted port catheters and peripherally inserted central catheters. And to give you a quick idea of Clinic A, it's a small independently managed clinic that's unaffiliated with any hospital. Staff includes a physician, a nurse, and a phlebotomist, as well as a few staff running the front desk. And they do medical evaluations as well as follow-up visits, phlebotomy, and infused chemotherapy. Patients often use Hospital A, a nearby but separate facility, for some select services such as inpatient admission or procedures like port placement. So back to our investigation. Since fungal HAI outbreaks are often associated with multiple types of fungi, we wanted our case definition to include a broader range of fungal organisms. So a case was defined as any non-candida yeast or mold identified on culture of blood or CVC from a patient who received care at Clinic A during January 1st through May 31st, 2016. 
for case finding, we reviewed microbiology records at Hospital A's network laboratory, and we then reviewed Clinic A charts for the January to May study period to identify patients who had a CVC in place or received an IV medication at the clinic, focusing on IV medications and venous lines since these were all bloodstream infections. Since the fifth patient had no symptoms and was only found because we did a surveillance blood culture, we asked all patients with a CVC or who received an IV medication at the clinic to have surve surveillance blood cultures drawn. And lastly, we reviewed the medical records and death certificates of deceased patients to determine if a fungal bloodstream infection might have contributed to their death. After the initial five cases were identified, no additional cases were found after reviewing the micro records at Hospital A. Review of the clinic records, however, did reveal uh, an additional case from March who had been seen at a hospital out of state. This patient was infected with another type of fungus called Rhodotorula mucilaginosa, which is also a common environmental yeast. And after beginning collection of surveillance blood cultures on patients who received an IV medication at Clinic A, all further cases were identified by this method for a total of 17 cases. None of the deceased uh, clinic patients were found to have evidence of fungal bloodstream infection. So case patients had a median age of 64 years and 59% were male. And all 17 case patients had an underlying malignancy, mostly solid organ disease. All case patients also had a CVC present and nearly all of those were port catheters. And most patients were asymptomatic, having only been identified from surveillance blood culture. 13 case patients were found to be infected with Exophyella dermatitidis, two with Rhodotorula mucilaginosa, and two were infected with both fungi. All 17 case patients were hospitalized for CVC removal and to initiate antifungal therapy, including the 12 asymptomatic patients. 90-day mortality was 18%, with three patients dying at 10, 74, and 78 days after diagnosis, respectively. We then performed a cohort investigation of patients who received an IV medication at Clinic A to identify risk factors for infection. 153 unique patients were seen at Clinic A during the study period, and our cohort was just the 38 patients who were exposed to an IV medication. Nine were excluded with six deceased and three declining to be evaluated, leaving 29 patients for subsequent analysis. 17 of those were cases, 12 non-cases. Since these were all oncology patients, we first wanted to look at their chemotherapy exposures as a possible source of infection. But no more than half of the 17 cases received any single chemotherapeutic medication, making chemo an unlikely cause of the infections. We also looked at other IV medications that are commonly used in conjunction with chemotherapy, such as dexamethasone and ondansetron. But four of those medications were single use for individual patients, and no more than 12 of the 17 cases received any one of these medications, making those also unlikely sources of the infections. However, all the cases, as well as all the non-cases, were exposed to a compounded IV flush solution that was used to flush CVCs. And I'll explain this a little bit more in a couple of slides. Since this was a universal exposure among cases and non-cases, we used alternative statistical methods to, do, to evaluate if this was a significant risk factor. And did so by exploring the dose-response relationship between the number of flushes received and case status. Median flushes for cases was 12 compared to four among non-cases, yielding a significant p-value. So what exactly is this compounded flush? Briefly, this was a solution compounded at the clinic by taking a one liter bag of normal saline and adding small amounts of two antibiotics and a blood thinner to it. The resulting bag of compounded flush solution was stored in a fridge and accessed multiple times a day with individual 10 milliliter syringes drawn from the bag over a four to eight week period until it was depleted. And this is a highly unusual practice. And so we next wanted to see if we could identify a single bag of fluid that could be the source. This broke down into three different bags over the study period based on the date the bag was compounded. And bag number two was the only bag to which all the cases were exposed and has a, had a significant p-value of less than 0 0.001. While we ideally could have done microbiologic testing on flush bag number two, 
Unfortunately, bag number two, having been compounded in February and depleted in April, was unavailable for sampling. Flush bag number three was still in use in the clinic, but it showed no growth of any organisms. And environmental samples were taken from areas and equipment at the clinic. They showed some growth of common environmental fungi, but uh, no exophyella or rhodotorula. We also performed whole genome sequencing on 14 case patient E. dermatitis isolates, as well as two other clinical isolates from New York City that were unrelated to the outbreak, and historical isolates from other U.S. locations to act as controls. Blue dots on the dendrogram indicate cases, pink dots the two unrelated New York City clinical isolates, and gray dots historical isolates. All the 14 cases are essentially identical at zero to two SNP differences and were not closely related to the other New York City isolates, which was consistent with a single point source for the outbreak, namely the compounded IV flush solution. So we performed infection control assessments to determine what might have gone wrong with this IV flush solution. But before I detail that, there are a couple of CDC documents that are applicable recommendations for the outpatient oncology setting including CDC's Guide to Infection Prevention for Outpatient Settings and the Basic Infection Control and Prevention Plan for Outpatient Oncology Settings. I'll highlight here some of the key practices that we observed that deviated from the standard recommendation, but this won't be a comprehensive list of CDC's recommendations or what we found at the clinic. Regarding general infection control practices and procedures, it's recommended to have written policies and procedures based on evidence-based guidelines, regulations, or standards. But no formal or written policies or procedures were found at Clinic A, nor could we identify an individual that would be designated to enforce infection control standards. It's also recommended by CDC that all healthcare personnel who are involved in direct patient care receive infection control training upon hire and that this be repeated annually or any time policies or procedures change. At Clinic A, only one staff member had reportedly received infection control training four years prior, but no documentation could be provided. Regarding injection safety, medications should be drawn up in a designated clean medication area to avoid contamination from any nearby unclean or used items. At Clinic A, no designated clean medication area existed, and IV medications were drawn up in multiple areas of the clinic, including in the lab area and patient rooms. Clinics should also avoid pre-filling and storing batch prepared syringes. But at Clinic A, batches of IV flush syringes from the compounded solution were being prepared every morning based on the number of patients scheduled for that day, and this was occurring for weeks at a time, with repeated entry allowing for more opportunities to potentially contaminate the solution. The recommended practice for storage of medications when they require refrigeration is to do so in a dedicated labeled refrigerator. But the IV flush solution bag and syringes at Clinic A were stored in a refrigerator that reportedly was also used for the occasional storage of staff food items. Here's a photo showing the chemotherapy infusion area at Clinic A. In the back left is where most medications were stored, and in the back right was the laboratory area and the nurses standing near the refrigerator where the flush bag was stored. As you can see, all these areas directly connect and there's no separation between where medications are prepared and where patients are treated. And in the upper right-hand photo is the interior of the small fridge where the flush solution was kept. And visible grime can be seen on the bottom. But also in this fridge was a plastic baggie stuffed with some moldy laboratory materials and paper towels. In addition, medications should always be discarded according to the manufacturer's expiration date, even if they're not opened as this is the final day that the manufacturer guarantees full potency and safety of a medication. But we found 39 vials of expired medications at Clinic A. Some of them expired for years, though it was unclear how many may have actually been in use. Before discussing the compounded flush, um, I wanted to familiarize you with the standards applicable anywhere sterile compounding is being done. The United States Pharmacopeia, or USP, is a scientific nonprofit organization that sets standards for the quality and purity of medicines. USP Chapter 797 sets practice standards to help ensure that compounded sterile preparations are of high quality and safety, and these standards can help prevent the harm to patients suffered as a result of contaminated preparations. 
Again, I'll note that the standards in USP 797 that I'll discuss and the findings at Clinic A are highlights rather than comprehensive. Some of USP Chapter 797's standards for sterile compounding address personnel training in aseptic manipulation skills, stipulating the need that personnel doing the compounding have been trained by expert personnel and pass a skills assessment. And there's also standards for labeling and storage of medications, hand washing, and the use of sterile gloves. And there are many standards for environmental quality and control, including separation of the compounding area from any other areas by a buffer or clean room, routine environmental monitoring, such as air particle and surface testing, and detailed procedures for cleaning and sanitizing the compounding area. At Clinic A, compounding was performed by a nurse who had no pharmaceutical training or performance assessment, and no pharmacist or pharmacy trained staff was providing supervision. There were no formal protocols for compounding the flush, and these are the nurse's handwritten notes that she used for reference. Compounded bags of IV flush were also improperly labeled, and then flush syringes were aliquoted over four to eight weeks until the bag was depleted. And storage times for compounded medications can vary depending on the medications used and the conditions under which they are compounded, but prolonged storage time will increase the potential for microbial growth in the event of contamination. The flush was compounded underneath a biological safety cabinet. Now, this would be appropriate for protecting personnel from hazardous medications being handled and protect the product from contamination. However, the photo on the right shows the contents of the area after the compounding process was demonstrated, with potentially contaminated materials in the critical sterile area, such as the outside plastic covering to the normal saline bag and the use of non-sterile gloves. There should also be annual inspection of the biological safety cabinet to ensure it's meeting regulations. But the last time it had been inspected at Clinic A was in 2014 when it was rejected for failure to meet appropriate airflow patterns. The location of the biological safety cabinet was also an issue. To the right is the photo I showed you earlier of the infusion area. And on the left, adjacent to the medication storage area, is the biological safety cabinet with no separation from other areas of the clinic, like the sink being very close nearby. And there was also no environmental monitoring that was done or cleaning protocols for this area, which was just wiped down at the end of the day with sandy wipes. So let's discuss. There are a number of contributing factors to this outbreak. One is substandard compounding of the IV flush solution, which was the only common exposure among all the case patients. And there was a dose-response relationship as increasing numbers of exposures to the flush was associated with greater risk of infection. Bag number two was the most likely bag that was contaminated, and whole genome sequencing was consistent with a single point source for this outbreak. But unsafe injection practices and improper medication storage were also issues, as the compounded flush bag was accessed multiple times a day for many weeks and was stored in an unlabeled refrigerator that was not exclusive for medication storage all of these leading to opportunities for contamination. More importantly, though, was the lack of awareness and adherence to basic infection control and prevention practices, which led to a failure to meet minimum safety standards for infection control and patient safety. There was also a failure to be aware of and meet standards for compounding of sterile medications, as well as a lack of oversight and enforcement of these standards. So we recommended infection control training for clinic staff and assessment of the oncology practice by an infection control profession, professional who could assist with ongoing remediation efforts. And it was paramount that Clinic A become compliant with CDC's guidance for infection prevention and control and to either apply the safe sterile compounding standards outlined by USP 797 or to cease further compounding and utilize a specialized compounding pharmacy if needed. During the investigation on May 31st, a commissioner's order to cease and desist practices at Clinic A was sent to the provider by the New York City Health Department. And this was amended on June 22nd with specific expectations of clinic practices before medication preparation or delivery could resume. On October 5th, the order was lifted after the clinic had undergone extensive remediation guided by a consulting infection control practitioner and pharmacist. It was also necessary that the clinic demonstrate ability to safely prepare and deliver medications. However, medication compounding is no longer occurring at the clinic. But unfortunately, these types of outbreaks are not uncommon to outpatient oncology clinics. 
And this is, in fact, just the latest in a series of outbreaks we've assisted with investigating. And the two shown here were associated with poor injection safety practices and improper medication preparation, respectively. However, while oncology clinics serve a vulnerable patient population and have a scope of medical practice that usually includes the prescribing and delivery of IV medications, issues of poor infection control and medication safety are not unique to oncology clinics. Challenges exist across many outpatient healthcare settings, such as pain management and orthopedic clinics where injections often occur. And there are likely more outpatient facilities performing similar medication and injection services. So what is it about outpatient clinics that makes their practices concerning? First, few outpatient healthcare facilities are licensed or accredited, and as a result, many facilities are opened and operated without being able without being held to minimum safety standards for infection control or other aspects of patient care. Outpatient facilities can also offer invasive procedures without being subject to on-site inspection. And there's no clearly established authority for monitoring adherence to infection control and sterile compounding standards in these settings. For example, many state boards of pharmacy only have authority to regulate compounding by pharmacies and pharmacists, rather than compounding at a clinic by a nurse or physician. And while the FDA has the authority to enforce applicable federal law over compounding, states maintain primary jurisdiction in these settings. There is often a lack of infrastructure and resources to support infection control and sterile compounding, and the latter may be conducted in the absence of pharmacy controls. Personnel are often inadequately trained, with continuing education requirements and other training varying greatly amongst states and other healthcare professionals. Providers that may be unaware that their practices are crossing over into complex medication preparation that is subject to federal and state sterile compounding laws and standards. And there are highly variable requirements for monitoring and reporting of HAIs and other adverse events. This can lead to delayed identification and response to outbreaks, which are often reported by someone other than the practice provider, such as a laboratory or an astute physician at a hospital. Such was the case in this outbreak. So there's been a tremendous investment by CDC to address these issues. In October of last year, CDC released the Outpatient Settings Policy Options for Improving Infection Prevention, which outlines possible effective strategies to improve oversight of outpatient settings. This document focuses on four key elements, facility licensing and accreditation, provider level training, licensing and certification, reporting requirements for HAIs, and effective application of investigative authorities. CDC continues to partner with state, local, and territorial health departments to identify gaps in oversight and enforcement of standards, and are involving medical specialty boards and professional organiza organizations to help raise awareness. So to summarize, this was an outbreak of 17 cases of exophyella dermatitidis, or rhodotorula mucilaginosa bloodstream infections, associated with a single oncology clinic and provider. Multiple lapses in infection control and prevention practices were noted at the clinic, as well as substandard sterile compounding, storage and handling of an IV flush solution, which was the likely source. And finally, in conclusion, oversight of infection control practices and medication compounding in outpatient oncology settings is an issue of great public health importance, and is probably occurring with greater frequency than we are aware. This is especially disconcerting since oncology clinics serve a vulnerable patient population, and we're working with public health partners to close the gap in awareness and enforcement of infection control and compounding sterile standards in outpatient settings. And I just want to quickly thank the many people who were critical to the investigation, especially those at the New York City and New York State Health Departments and the Mycotic Diseases Branch here at CDC for helping lead the investigation. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Vasquez. Um, it might not have been clear to the audience, but you served as a part of the investigation team in what capacity? Yeah, I was the lead EIS, EIS officer, so I led the field team um, as we you know, did our epidemiologic investigation, infection control assessments, and made our recommendations. Okay, well thank you again for a really excellent summary of uh, a complex investigation, um, a very unfortunate outbreak. Um, as you pointed out, uh, this harm was uh, preventable. Um, we'll turn next 
to the lead of the New York City um, component of the investigation team, Dr. Acklesberg, for further comment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Purs. Um, my presentation is titled Wild Wild West, Public Health Options uh, to, to Expand Oversight of Outpatient Oncology Practices. And I think, um, are you hearing some feedback there? Fortunately, yes. Okay, let me see if I can address that. Yep, feel free to take a moment. How's that? Much better. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, well, the wild, wild west was a term used multiple times during this investigation to describe the likely ground truth practice reality throughout the outpatient oncology terrain. Over the past 10 years, public health agencies have become increasingly familiar with the risks emanating from compounding pharmacies. However, compounding pharmacies like the New England Compounding Center are a fairly recent phenomenon. Before getting into the federal and state regulatory issues uh, that we will look at in a few minutes, it's worthwhile to very briefly review some of the underlying circumstances that led to the emergence of these uh, medication preparation entities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just uh, You can just go through these quickly. Quickly, the next one. Okay, next slide, please. Thanks. For the first half of the 20th century, community pharmacists often prepared medications from components kept in their establishments. Physicians would order medications and pharmacists would prepare them by mixing components, that is, compounding medications. Next slide, please. Before dispensing them to individual patients. Um, it is estimated that in the 1930s and 1940s, approximately 60% of the medications dispensed by pharmacists was compounded. In 2006, it was estimated that fewer than 1% of community pharmacies did any medication compounding. Next slide, please. I want to uh, note here that much of the material in this next set of slides comes from an excellent historical review by Charles Myers that was published in uh, 2013 by the American Journal of Health Systems Pharmacy. Hospital pharmacies in the first decades of the 20th century were similar to community pharmacies. Medications for patients often were individually compounded by a pharmacist in the hospital dispensary. Into the 1950s, large volume sterile IV solutions, which could include medications, and sterile irrigation solutions were compounded in central sterile service departments. Vitamins and minerals were added on nursing stations for individual patients as deemed necessary. By the 1960s, because of growing concerns about drug safety, this admixture function slowly shifted to hospital pharmacies. This was the time when the field of clinical pharmacy began to flourish. In the 1970s, new IV delivery systems, including piggybacking of medications, enhanced the flexibility of parenteral medication of administration. With the advent of individualized chemotherapeutic regimens in the 1980s, Medication admixture became centralized in hospital pharmacies. The, event, the invention of the laminar flow hood in the 1960s and then the biological safety cabinet were major advances in medication preparation safety. These technical advances also had the impact of increasing the use of a centralized hospital pharmacy for medication preparation and admixture. With the advent of total parenteral nutrition in the 1970s and then cardioplegia in the 1980s, extremely complex procedures for compounding sterile preparations became necessary in hospital pharmacies. Both technolo technologic improvements, such as automated medication compounding and medical reimbursement pressures, led to hospitals identifying new approaches for treating patients. More and more patients had procedures and surgery conducted in freestanding ambulatory care settings, and patients had home infusion of medications that had previously been administered in hospitals, demonstrating that medication compounding could be done outside of the hospital setting. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, by 2001, shortages of drugs manufactured by generic manufacturers became frequent and long-lasting. The Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Mon Modernization Act of 2003 may have produced profit margins, may have reduced profit margins for drug manufacturers, causing some of them to drop out of the marketplace. By 2012, injection drug shortages were commonplace. 
compounding pharmacies um, became a more frequent source for injected medications. It was during this period that outbreaks were periodically linked to contamination of parenteral medications in compounding pharmacies. It took some time before regulatory authorities were given the tools to put into place standards for sterile medication compounding that facilities of all sizes should be expected to follow. U.S. Pharmacopeia Chapter 797 for Compounding Sterile Preparations was published in 2004, and this was followed by Chapter 800, Handling of Hazardous Drugs in Healthcare Settings, which is scheduled to be implemented in 2018 and is particularly germane for outpatient oncology settings. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, first passed in 1938, was periodically amended to address the changing medication preparation terrain. It was most recently changed in 2013 in response to the fungal meningitis outbreak caused by the New England Compounding Center. Note that the relevant language in the Act covers both pharmacists and physicians who engage in compounding medications and that they are mandated to follow U.S. pharmacopoeia standards. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, next slide please, sets the legal safety standards that drug, drug manufacturers must follow. It also provides the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, with the legal authority to inspect drug manufacturers. This now includes outsourcing facilities, a new designation for compounding pharmacies that was included in the 2013 amendment to the Act. Importantly, outsourcing facilities are now required to follow current good manufacturing practices that drug manufacturers are required to use. State boards of pharmacy are charged with enforcing the drug safety provisions of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in their local uh, jurisdictions. Most of the outbreaks invol involving sterile drug preparation, and certainly those that have caused the most uh, public health impacts and professional concern, uh, next slide please, have involved breaks in asepsis within compounding pharmacies. Next slide please. Moreover, the federal and state laws and regulations that have evolved over time have been directed uh, largely at hospital pharmacies and compounding pharmacies that conduct, conduct business that more resembles drug manufacturing than hospital-based clinical pharmacy. However, this outbreak of fungal bloodstream infections was caused by improper preparation of compounded sterile preparations in an outpatient oncologist's private office. An IV flood flush solution that was stored in a refrigerator for up to two months was improperly prepared in a biological safety cabinet that was last tested and failed inspection in 2014 in which it was situated next to a refrigerator and in, in which improper technique was used to prepare parenteral medications. The refrigerator contained chemotherapeutics that expired years beforehand, loose needles, and unsecured narcotics. Multiple partially used IV bags were also found on shelves with their administration set still attached. The New York State Board of Pharmacy's contention during the management of this outbreak was that the oncologist's pharmacy practices fell outside of their jurisdiction. After speaking with the New York State Department of Health, which has an office that addresses clinical misconduct, it became clear that there was a considerable regulatory gap in regard to pharmacy-related and infection prevention practices practices by outpatient physicians, specifically oncologists. They could rescind the provider's license if an investigation uncovered malfeasance, but there was no ongoing oversight of outpatient provider settings other than a requirement for them to take an online infection control course every four years. The New York State Department of Health regulates hospitals, nursing homes, diagnostic and treatment centers, such as dialysis services, and large outpatient clinics. They do not regulate solo practices and other small outpatient settings. By default, most outpatient physician offices fall under the purview of local health departments. But the New York City Health Code doesn't authorize the New York City Health Code, uh, New, York, New York City Health Department, to regulate physicians not regulated by the state. However, the health department does have broad powers that include abatement of public nuisances, which was the basis of the commissioner's order that shut down the oncology practice pending sufficient remediation of the problems that were identified by investigations, uh, investigators from CDC, the New York City Health Department, and the New York State Department of Health. I've never heard the word egregious used so many times by so many people to describe the conditions found in this provider's office. 
In a highly unusual move, inspectors from the FDA's district office spent two days looking into the medication preparation and administration practices in the oncologist's office. This actually begged the question, was this an, an anomaly or the chance detection by an astute ICU clinician of a more common event that typically flies under the public health radar? Dr. Vasquez already noted that the 2011 to 2012 outbreak of Tsukumorella bloodstream infections in another outpatient oncologist's office also was caused by improper preparation of IV flushes. Is it the wild, wild west out there in regard to outpatient oncology practice with a significant but undetermined public health burden? Ideally, to answer this question, we would need to identify the universe of solo practice like New York City oncologists who do not practice under the aegis of an academic medical center or hospital and their distribution across the five boroughs. An oncology colleague suggested to us a strategy for characterizing this terrain that we have started to explore. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services publishes Medicare provider utilization and payment public use files or PUF files that are available publicly. The data contain all requests by providers for reimbursement from Medicare fee for service for clinical services and medical products dispensed to patients. The data are aggregated by provider in that the total number of reimbursement requests for particular services and products are listed in each provider record, which also includes the mailing address of the provider. By filtering for chemotherapeutics and services used by oncologists, by providers who self-identify as oncologists, and by the, those who practice in small outpatient settings that are not associated with acad academic medical centers, we can arrive at a rough estimate of the universe and distribution of the independent outpatient oncologists of interest. Once we have the information just described, we will be able to devise a sampling strategy to survey, survey outpatient oncologists by phone and to directly observe a subset of them. In this way, we can determine how wildly wild and egregious it truly is out there. With those data, we will be in, in a stronger position to consider regulatory options with the New York State Department of Health, such as requiring a separate level of, of accreditation of outpatient oncologists, as is currently required of providers who conduct office-based surgery. Professional organizations such as the American Society of Clinical Oncologists also might consider enhancement of the professional standards expected in these outpatient oncology settings. We have scheduled ongoing discussions with New York State to explore these options. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ecclesburg. Uh, personally, I'd like to commend you and your team, not only for organizing and managing this investigation, but for looking farther upstream and um, helping us understand better the regulatory landscape and the conditions um, that uh, you know, might have been considered or overly permissive in this case um, as far as resulting in the risks to patients that Dr. Vasquez uh, described in her presentation. Um, with that, we'll turn to Dr. Lisa Richardson. Thank you, Dr. Perz, and thank you, Dr. Vasquez and Ecclesburg for your presentation. As co-lead of CDC's Preventing Cancer Infections and Cancer Patients Program, I'd like to add some further evidence we have found as to why this is a growing public health concern. As providers, I know you understand the risk associated with cancer and chemotherapy treatment. Each year, 650,000 cancer patients receive outpatient chemotherapy, which puts them at risk for one of the deadliest side effects of chemotherapy, neutropenia, or low white count. 60,000 cancer patients are hospitalized for chemotherapy-induced neutropenia and infections, and one patient dies every two hours from this complication. They may not be aware of their risk for developing a low white count and actions they can take to lower their risk of infection. As Dr. Vasquez and Ecclesburg talked about, some outpatient oncology facilities lack written information on infection control and prevention and are not routinely inspected, or routine inspected at all, really. Likewise, patients may be overwhelmed with the amount of information they are bombarded with at the time of a cancer diagnosis making it almost impossible for patients to remember all the information they receive. Together, these two factors can contribute to unnecessary infections. For this reason, the CDC developed the Preventing Cancer Infections in Cancer Patients program to raise awareness among patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers about steps they can take to prevent infections during cancer chemotherapy. 
To meet this objective, several strategies were implemented, including developing improved and consistent infection control information for outpatient oncology providers, as we heard, and creating user-friendly resources to help patients better understand their risk of developing neutropenia and infections during treatment. As mentioned in Dr. Vasquez's presentation, CDC developed or created the Basic Infection Control and Prevention Plan for outpatient oncology settings. The plan was created to standardize and improve infection prevention practices by providing essential elements to meet minimal expectations of patient safety, which are all based on guidelines from CDC and professional societies. The plan is broken down into several main sections. The first section I'd like to mention is on education and training. It encourages ongoing education and training of clinic staff to maintain competency and ensure that infection prevention policies and procedures are understood and followed. This should be done at orientation and repeated at least annually and any time policies or procedures are updated or new staff are hired. Regular audits should also be performed to ensure staff adherence and competency in infection prevention practices such as proper hand hygiene and environmental cleaning. The second important component deals with surveillance and reporting. Routine performance of surveillance activities is important to case finding, outbreak detection, and quality improvement in healthcare practices. All facilities should conduct surveillance for healthcare associated infections, such as central line associated bloodstream infections, and process measures, such as proper hand hygiene technique. And all staff should adhere to local, state, and federal requirements for outbreak reporting. The third component covers standard precautions. These are a set of infection control practices used to prevent transmission of diseases that can be acquired by contact with blood, body fluids, non-contact, non-intact skin, including rashes, and mucous membranes. These are the basic infection control precautions which are to be used at a minimum in the care of all patients, not just oncology patients. The next section covers transmission sorry, transmission-based precautions, which are implemented in special situations. You should use contact precautions when you have a case of known or suspected infectious diarrhea, draining wounds, or skin lesions, droplet precautions when you have a patient with a potential or confirmed respiratory infection, and airborne precautions for patients known or suspected to be infected with a pathogen that can be transmitted by the airborne route, such as tuberculosis, chickenpox, or measles. And the last section pertains to access and maintenance of long-term central venous catheters. This plan recommends practices for general maintenance and access procedures, which include the use of aseptic technique for accessing central venous catheters, blood draws from catheters, proper flushing techniques, and changing catheter site dressings and injection caps. The plan also outlines catheter-specific recommendations for peripherally inserted central catheters, tunneled catheters, and implanted ports. The plan also includes additional resources. Appendix A is meant to be completed and tailored to any facility that would like to have one document that lists the person responsible for implementing the plan as well as their roles and responsibilities in infection prevention. As we saw from the presentation by Dr. Vasquez and Ecclesburg, most places do not have um, an infection prevention checklist in their setting. And as um, Dr. Ecclesburg said, this is not unique to outpatient oncology settings. This is all ambulatory settings, I believe. The checklist should be used to ensure that your facility is, has appropriate infection prevention policies and procedures in place, as well as the proper supplies for staff to implement these policies. It can also be used to assess personnel adherence to standardized infection prevention practices, such as hand washing. And lastly, the final appendix is a list of additional resources and links to national guidelines. My hope for all of you listening today is that if your clinic doesn't have an infection control plan in place, that you start using the plan and further supplement as needed. If your facility has an existing protocol, you can use the plan as a guide to ensure that the essential elements are included. I'd like to spend the last few minutes talking about how we achieved our second strategy of creating user-friendly resources to help your patients understand their risk of developing a low white blood cell count how to understand the signs and symptoms of a possible infection, and what they can do to lower their risk of getting an infection. The website includes a suite of educational fact sheets, posters, blogs, and more on preventcancerinfections.org. Users have two options. They may complete a brief risk assessment questionnaire 
and receive tailored information, sorry, information infection control messages based on their risk for um, a low white count, or user can simply explore the website and download materials as they wish. So if you scroll down past the risk level message, you will see a grid of health tip sheets. Topics include how to care for your catheter, food and kitchen safety, signs and symptoms of infection, um, and more. One thing we heard from our focus groups in our early development stage was not everyone would utilize the risk assessment questionnaire. Some would just be able to access the information without answering um, any questions. For this reason, the website has also includes a resource page where educational and other resources can be downloaded. Thank you for your time today, and now I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Perth. Thank you very much, Dr. Richardson. Yes, I think, you know, um, we're reminded that while unsafe medication preparation practices um, may very well be occurring um, with perhaps even increasing frequency in a wide variety of outpatient settings that cancer patients are especially vulnerable. Um, I think that, you know, this really is a, a, an example for us to, to, to take to heart because, um, you know, I can't think of a patient population, you know, um, for whom, you know, our obligation to provide safe care uh, could be any greater. You know, this is a patient population that's, you know, seeking to improve Prove or at least preserve its health and to suffer setbacks because of um, preventable infection risks is, um, is, is, is really a tragedy. Um, I, I, we, we are going to transition now to the Q&A um, section. I want to remind folks that they can submit their questions you know, through the, web, um, the webinar interface. Um, there were a few questions that came in, so um, um, I'll be um, trying to um, uh, address those um, with the help of our presenters. Um, but first I had a question um, having to do with outbreak detection and reporting. Um, Dr. Richardson mentioned in her presentation that um, the materials that CDC has developed and made available include guidance on uh, monitoring for infections and um, reminders about the obligation to report uh, potential outbreaks. Um, I wondered if uh, Dr. Acklesberg or perhaps Dr. Vasquez could speak a little bit about um, how this outbreak uh, in New York City came to light and um, perhaps uh, any sense of, you know, whether this is uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Acklesberg, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, th that really is the, um, the main question, um, and it's... Um, you know, you know, to, to the end of answering that question, that we're we're doing um, what I um, just briefly described at the end of the presentation. Um, one thing, you know, it's unclear to what extent uh, the you know the comprehensive um, practice guidelines that um, have been developed by CDC have actually penetrated um, into the uh, ongoing. Uh, practice of, of uh, ambulatory care medicine um, in general and, and in the oncology uh, community, um, you know, specifically. Um, I can tell you that uh, this practice, in this practice, uh, there certainly was not a, um, a systematic um, um, method of surveilling for uh, blood, bloodstream or other infections. Um, as Dr. Vasquez mentioned, there was no written practice uh, protocol um, that um, included procedures to notify um, local public health when um, um, clusters of, of illness um, um, were de detected as required by uh, the New York City Health uh, Code. Um, so it's quite possible that uh, this is um, you know, a, a fairly common um, situation um, in in all outpatient settings, uh, let alone in in uh, in oncology practices. Uh, we heard about this um, uh, outbreak uh, because it was no, it was noticed in in an ICU where two patients from the same um, provider were were hospitalized in um, you know at the same time. 
So, um, you know, it was, it was good fortune that we, we heard about it. It was also good fortune, I think, that um, a more um, virulent and pathogenic uh, mold wasn't involved in, in this outbreak. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's really a, uh, a cautionary tale that um, there's probably um, more of this going on, or at least the potential for it, um, that, that needs to be looked at um, as, uh, as possible uh, in, in, um, in, in cities and, and state public health uh, jurisdictions. Yeah, thank you very much for, 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 those, um, for making those points. Um, yeah, again, a, re a reminder that um, outbreak detection is currently really quite haphazard. Um, and as you put it, we were fortunate um, that this was uh, detected and reported um, uh, apparently somewhat early. So that, that leads to a question for Dr. Vasquez. Um, can you talk about the decision um, regarding um, advising removal of catheters? and um, any sense of uh, what effect that had in terms of uh, the burden of illness here? Yeah, um, absolutely. The, one of the remarkable things about this outbreak um, that I didn't get to touch on in the presentation uh, is the fact that it was found early, even if it was somewhat lucky. Um, you know, that there was a report from an ID physician to the health department that prompted the investigation. Our active case finding through surveillance blood cultures identified 12 patients who were very vulnerable. They were undergoing uh, chemotherapy, they were immunosuppressed, uh, and they could have suffered much uh, more dire complications, uh, but in fact, they, they never even had symptoms. Um, so we identified them early, uh, but a handful of them, um, two or three of them, were actually identified because we took out their central venous catheter, even though we'd done a blood culture and it was negative. Uh, so it, it sort of happened at that point in the investigation that we were already pretty confident that we had found the likely source of this, and uh, we consulted with um, some experts at local um, academic institutions at the New York City Health Department as well as uh, the experts um, at the Mycotic Diseases Branch to sort of come up with some uh, treatment recommendations to guide Hospital A uh, in helping to manage these patients. I mean, Hospital A really shouldered a large burden of caring for these patients as we identified them and had them go in for cultures, have their CVCs removed, have them seen by an infectious disease physician to start fungal therapy even if they weren't having symptoms. Um, and in fact, you know, many of those patients were identified uh, via that method. Thank you. Dr. Perth, if I can just add to that, uh, Dr. Perth, just for a second. Sure. Um, I, I would just I would just like to underscore that um, Hospital A um, really just performed um, heroically in this uh, in this outbreak. Um, um, you know, it's we, we see that often here um, um, in the Big Apple, but um, uh, they were asked to do um, um, a lot, and they and they shol shouldered a, a heavy burden, and and um, uh, we're very grateful for. Um, uh, the the efforts uh, of uh, of that particular healthcare institution. Yeah, thank uh, you for Dr. highlighting Perth, that. I think it's uh, really Richardson? essential in situations that yeah. we get good cooperation between yeah. um, you know our healthcare um, our, our our healthcare partners and public health. Lisa, was that you adding a comment? Yeah, it was. I just wanted to to make a comment about the uh, central venous catheters. So I'm an oncologist by training, and I think other physicians as well, that we become complacent when these devices are in place and we forget that these are foreign bodies and that if there are issues or problems, that, you know, the, the, um, the more conservative thing you can do is to remove them regardless of what, you know, what the problem is or what the organism is because it's still going to be there and it's very difficult to treat a foreign body like that while it's still in. Thank you very much. There's a question that came in, Lisa, which I don't know if um, you'll be able to help address or not, but um, let's have a go at it. Um, well, actually, while I'm trying to um, locate that one, um, here's one that's jumping out at me. Um, and it has to do with um, outside of the, um, the hoods that were being used for med prep in this clinic, um, considering the more general patient care environment um, were there other concerns in terms of cleanliness, um, areas of contamination? 
Right, yeah, thank you for um, asking that question because uh, it's absolutely critical. We did evaluate um, you know, the environment not just inside the clinic but in the hallways outside the clinic, in the areas out on the street. Um, and it's almost uh, a given, maybe not in out, you know, standing clinics, but um, certainly in hospitals these days you hear about construction going on. There was some um, sort of adjacent to the building, but uh, not really in direct communication to the clinic. There wasn't a window nearby or anything. Um, and so there wasn't something that was sort of directly communicating with the outside environment. There was a back door that went to a hallway that, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to eat off the floor or anything. I mean, it was uh, a hallway that led to, you know, an apartment complex and it was cement floor, et cetera. So, um, uh, but nevertheless, you know, we sampled quite a bit of the environment and um, as you might expect, there was some organisms that we found. I mean, you'd, it's not completely sterile in any um, uh, outpatient clinic like this. So, uh, unfortunately, we just didn't find any Exophiala or Rhodotorula, but um, in, in any, you know, as patients are coming back to that area, I mean, this was not a clean, sterile area where these medications were being prepared. Patients were coming through and they're, you know, coming in in their street clothes and shoes, et cetera. And even if you're just, you know, uh, you know, cleaning the, the, the floors on a regular basis, there's still, it, you're directly communicating medication preparation with where um, there's high traffic and patients are being cared for. So there's still going to be opportunity um, for contamination of medications. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, um, I'm realizing that um, we're coming up on time. We unfortunately won't be able to get um, to every question that's been submitted um, as part of the follow-up, you know, the, the slides and additional information um, archiving this presentation will be um, presented or um, placed on the CDC website to the extent possible. We'll try to summarize some of the additional questions and provide um, responses. Um, one, one question, a couple of the questions are, are getting at standards. Um, for example, um, construction standards for outpatient uh, clinics of this type. Um, I know that the, you know, the Facility Guidelines Institute um, is um, a, a cross-cutting body that includes uh, input from infection preventionists, um, but uh, more so from healthcare architects and others. I think, you know, clearly more attention to um, thoughtful um, purposeful design of these types of facilities is something that's required. Mm -hmm. There's a question here about does CMS, um, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, have rules in place for following USP 797 and uh, other uh, relevant uh, standards in these private clinics? Um, Lisa, jump in if, if you know um, more about that than I do. My sense is that that's probably a, a policy lever that uh, could be explored. Um, Medicare, of course, is paying for a lot of outpatient cancer care. And um, whereas on the inpatient side or other facility types like dialysis, nursing homes, um, there's a lot of attention to CMS uh, conditions for participation that spell out infection control standards. I don't think that's the case. Um, for independent outpatient uh, oncology. So I, I think you're right, Joe. Um, that does not currently exist, but you know the hopeful sign that I heard in Dr. Ecclesburg's uh, presentation is that you know CMS may get involved in New York City, and it is a, a great lever because they pay for most of the cancer care in this country. So that would be a way to go as a policy lever, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, we've come up um, almost on the end of time, and um, to make this official, we need to review information for our participants to um, obtain their continuing education credits. So um, you should be seeing a slide on screen. Um, I'll just summarize that um, to receive your educational um, credit, you need to pass the post-test activity. Um, you need to get a 66% uh, minimum score for that. Um, when you close out of the webinar, a post-meeting web page will appear. That will have detailed instructions about completing the post-test and evaluation. For folks who are perhaps listening on the phone but aren't logged into ReadyTalk, um, please go to www.cdc.gov slash TCE online. The access code for the webinar is WC0418. Again, a follow-up email will be sent out later this afternoon with more detailed instructions, so everybody who's registered should have access to those instructions. And with that, um, as the clock strikes uh, 3 o'clock Eastern here in Atlanta, I'd like to thank 
all of our speakers as well as all of you who tuned in today for taking the time and for your commitments to keeping patients safe. Thank you very much.